in my 20s, I, I spent five or six years being a, a drug addict. Um, I had an unholy attraction to opiate narcotics, and it uh, got me in a lot of trouble, of course. Um, at one point, I was a psychology student by day, and uh, uh, by night, a thief. I, I stole morphine from my lab rats. Uh, it's a lot more than they needed. And, and uh, I also went out and stole things from pharmacies and medical centers, and I got arrested, I got convicted, I got kicked out of graduate school, my girlfriend left me. Um, despite all that crap, I, I still I, uh, couldn't stop for, for quite a while, about two and a half more years. I tried a lot of times, as people do, addicts try to stop a lot, and it's hard. Um, anyway, then I, I got back into school, and uh, I did finally quit. And I got back into grad school, and I uh, got a PhD in psychology and went on to become a professor in psychology and neuroscience, which is what I've been doing the last 20-something years. And um, for the last five of those years, I've gone back to addiction, uh, this time as a as a scientist and um, kind of a commentator, trying to blend subjective stories of addiction with the science, the neuroscience especially, of, of addiction, what happens in the brain. And uh, I think that there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of scope for that to help us understand how addiction works and why it's so hard to stop. Um, so in that context, a lot of people ask me, how did you quit? I mean, how did you actually do it? And the answer for a long time has been, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly how it worked. Um, but now, especially in preparation for this conference, I've been thinking a lot about trust, and I think that the answer uh, is, um, is exactly self-trust. I think that is the pivotal thing, the thing that, that addicts need and find so difficult to, to achieve is, is self-trust. Um, so I'm going to talk about two, two uh, psychological phenomena that I, I think help explain why um, well, why self-trust is so elusive, so difficult for addicts to achieve, and why it's so pivotal, so important in order for them to, uh, to get better. Um, the first of these is called ego depletion. <laughs> I was going to give up any minute. Um, <laughs> um, these are the parts of the prefrontal cortex that are in charge of uh, impulse control, and they get tired like a muscle. They start to wear out, so you can't keep impulse control going actively for a long period of time. This, uh, the classic experiment is hungry people are brought into the lab, and they are sat down in front of a bowl of chocolate chip cookies or a bowl of radishes and told they can't eat any. And then uh, 15 or so minutes later, they are given um, a set of cognitive tasks, and the ones who couldn't eat the cookies don't do as well. They seem to be missing some special cognitive resource that's needed uh, for control. And um, so that's how it works. And uh, the problem for addicts is that it's, it's more serious because they have to keep up self-control not just for 15 minutes, but for hour after hour after hour, day after day after day, and uh, it's extremely taxing, which is why when people think of addicts as, as being lazy or weak, it's really just the opposite. They work very hard to get through the day. Um, the other problem is that you're trying to keep up control when there are cues all around you, cues to the thing that you're addicted to. So uh, the chocolate chip cookies are never far away, and that makes it more difficult. Um, Recent research shows that if you believe that you can control your impulses, then you do a better job in, in an ego depletion context. You can hold on for longer. Nobody knows exactly why, but it could be because you don't have to stave off the feelings of self-doubt. You can just focus on the single task of restraining that, uh, that one impulse. So, that's also a real problem for addicts because they don't believe they can do it. They don't believe in their ability to control themselves. Why should they? It never works. <laughs> They've tried it many, many times and it never works, and so they don't believe they can do it. And so this lack of self-trust is a second, uh, you know, a second um, bullet in their capacity to, uh, to withhold uh, their, their um, impulses. Okay, the, the next phenomenon is called this is a really resistant button. Maybe if I press that end of it. There. Okay. It's called delay discounting. And that is the tendency for um, 
for humans and other animals to value immediate rewards above long-term rewards or future rewards. So if I were to offer you five euros today uh, or 10 euros next week, you would probably go for five euros today. It would seem more valuable, even though objectively it's not. So that's delay discounting. It's built into uh, all mammals and birds as well. And uh, for addicts, what that amounts to is, should I get high now, today, tonight, or should I hold off so that I can have a happy marriage in, in next month, or keep my job, or get a better job, or stay out of jail, or have money in the bank? Uh, these distant rewards pale in comparison with the immediate reward, and that's a problem. And it's especially a problem for addicts because that part of your brain right there, the blue one, is called the striatum. And that is the area that's responsible for, um, well, for, for achieving goals, for seeking goals. And that area is flooded with a neurochemical called dopamine when addicts are anticipating getting the thing that they're addicted to. The function of dopamine, dopamine's been around for hundreds of millions of years, and its evolutionary function is to get you to focus on what's going on right now, right in front of you. So in other words, go for the low-hanging fruit or the low-hanging sexual partner. That's a terrific uh, sec um, advantage for evolution, but it's not a great advantage for addicts who are trying not to focus on the immediate present. So you see, that makes it more difficult as well. Um, okay, so is there an antidote for delayed discounting? I think that, and uh, some other people have said that the antidote might be a dialogue that you have with yourself, what you could call an intertemporal dialogue between your future self and your present self. So your future self says, um, just hold on, the craving will go away after a while, and you know, you're going to be okay, and in a few weeks things are going to be a lot better. And the present self says, okay, I believe you, and uh, that's, that's cool, you know, I'll see you later. Uh, and, um, the, uh, the problem for addicts is that their future self is also an addict. Because if you've already been an addict for five years or 10 years, it's not very likely that you're not gonna be an addict in a few weeks or a month from now. So you see, your future self isn't really someone you can trust. Uh, and the dialogue that you have with that future self might be, um, well, rather ineffective because it doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get you past the moment. It doesn't get you out of where you are. Um, so, if you can't trust your present self, and you can't trust your future self, who can you trust? For addicts, the answer is very clear. <laughs> you trust the thing that you're addicted to. And it's not just drugs. It can be drugs, it can be booze, it can be cigarettes, it can be sex, it can be the internet, it can be gambling. You know, there's that whole range of things. They all function all, all, pretty much the same. So you trust that thing, and it makes you feel better for a little while, and Come on. Maybe if I sneak up on this button. Yeah. It makes you feel better for a while, but not for that long. And uh, then you feel worse afterwards, and so you feel betrayed again, and you've betrayed yourself. And so whatever little bit of self-trust you're able to muster is then used up. Um, okay, so the way I quit the 187th time or so that I tried, I, I wrote the word no on a piece of paper. I, I put it uh, on the wall where I had to go by it every day, and I told myself, I can do this. I can say no to myself for an hour, which means I can say no to myself for another hour. And I started to believe it. I worked it. I pep-talked myself until I really believed I could do it. I also told myself that I wasn't going to do drugs again ever, not just for six months or a year, but forever. And that seemed much more credible. So I formed that kind of trusting relationship in a future self. And uh, it worked. It worked for me. And I, I'll end by saying that uh, the treatment programs for addiction nowadays seem to stress pretty much the opposite. Instead of trusting yourself, they often emphasize um, giving your trust to a higher power, whether that's God or the group or the doctor, seeing yourself as having a disease so you're kind of helpless. And I think that's the wrong way to go. I think the kind of help that addicts need is to help in forming, um, finding a part of themselves that they can trust and, uh, and forming that intimate dialogue so that they can reach out for a future um, that they can live with. Thank you.